Hi everyone, this is the Chutabhava from Nightlight Astrology. It's Saturday, March 21st, and today I'm going to show you a couple of chart demonstrations from my horary astrology practice that have involved the coronavirus before I really knew how big of a deal the coronavirus was going to be. This is interesting because uh, it illustrates a couple of things. One, that a lot of different symbols in the sky can speak to someone being affected by this, not just one planet. And um, two, that it's just funny as you know, you're a reader and you're sometimes you're delivering, you know, like I've, I delivered a bunch of no's to people on stuff. And I, and I, you know, I, it's not always like that, you know what I mean? And to see a lot of the answers coming back, like, yeah, the horror was right. And it's because of the coronavirus. So at any rate, let me show you a couple of these and, and you might find them interesting. So Remember that I teach a horary astrology class. My horary astrology class starts in June. Um, you're welcome to join. There is need-based tuition if you're experiencing hardship during all, of, all that's going on right now. Um, and there's an early bird rate in effect right now as well. Um, so please check that out. I don't want anyone to ever be priced out of studying astrology. It's something to do if you're stuck at home. And again, I'm really glad to work with people's budgets if you know, you're, you're really getting pinched by everything that's happening. I know a lot of people are. So anyway, uh, let me show you these examples of hor uh, from my horary practice that involve the coronavirus. Now, I've simplified these charts, stripped them down to the bare bones so that you can really grasp the concepts. Um, so a horary chart is a chart cast for the moment. It's like a birth chart that's being cast for a question. And this form of astrology became really popular during the medieval era of astrology. Uh, it was, seems to have been really developed and taken, um, taken to the next level, so to speak, between the Hellenistic era and sometime during the medieval period. You see the sort of Persian, Arab, Indian influence on horary astrology as it, um, really strongly before it kind of comes back over to Europe. Um, arguably, this is one of the oldest forms of astrology, but we certainly see the most evidence of the techniques and uh, the textbooks that t teach the techniques coming about during the medieval period. So at any rate, uh, it's a birth chart for the moment of a question. And the question is usually very predictive and specific and outcome oriented. For example, this question was, am I stable in my current job? And this was asked back in November. Uh, so I want to show you how I read this. So first of all, the person who is asking the question will always be given the planet that rules the ascendant and oftentimes the moon as a co-significator. In this case, the querent is moon in Aries. That's what they're represented by. That's like the planet that's going to play them as an actor on the stage. doesn't matter which planet it is. It's just whatever planet rules the first house, plus the moon. In this case, it is the moon. So the querent is represented solely by the moon. Now, you can see that the Moon is in the 10th house, which is the house of career and shows us her, let's say, emotional concern about her career. But the planet that's going to represent the career itself is going to be the ruler of the 10th house, which is the career house. Thus, it is Jupiter in Sagittarius. Now, she's asking if she's in a stable position at her job. There's a lot of different things we could look for. But one of the things that we look for in Horary is an imminent change that is happening to the significator of the quesited, the thing that we're asking about. So in other words, is anything about to happen to the job? We look at the planet that rules the job and see, is it about to have a hard aspect to Saturn or Mars? Or is it about to change signs and lose all of its dignity? Which yes, in this case it is. So this is how I judge the chart. It's in the sixth house, which is traditionally a house that was unfortunate, a difficult house, a house that also pertains to sickness and disease. And you'll notice that Jupiter at that point was about 25 degrees of Sagittarius and basically on the brink of moving into the next sign of Capricorn, where Jupiter then goes into its fall and loses all of its dignity. So my judgment was that either something will happen to the company that will be unfortunate or your position will be taken away or something, um, you know, something that happens that somehow harms you a bit. Now, why do I say that it would harm her personally? I mean, the job, the company could uh, suddenly undergo some kind of crisis, but that might make her busier than ever, right? So how do I know that this could also maybe not be so good for her? Well, when Jupiter enters Capricorn and goes into its fall, not only does the job potentially fall apart, which could obviously mean that she just loses her job or that her job falls apart, but we can also get a hint that this is really going to potentially hurt her more personally because... Jupiter, when it moves into Capricorn, will be in the detriment of the moon, right? So the reception changes. 
Um, this is a particular way of looking at reception that I studied with one of my horary teachers. But this, all in all, I judged to be, now nah, you're, you're, uh, you're not in stable territory. The question was, is my job stable? My, in, a, in a stable position at my job? And the answer here is no. And then we time it out. How many degrees is Jupiter away from its fall? Five. That number of degrees becomes a symbolic number in the same way that tarot cards and their numbers are sometimes used to indicate units of time, like months or weeks or days or something like that. So five units, five degrees, five units of time. And what is most likely uh, five days? Well, you know, as someone who's nothing is necessarily wrong with their job, but they're just, they're wondering about it. She didn't have any major reason to, to be worried at the time, but she was, she had some kind of hunch. Five units of time, five days, probably not likely. So I said five weeks or five months as a likely time frame uh, within which the job may deteriorate um, and probably more like months. Now, sometimes you can take a look at someone's natal chart and get a little bit of a cross comparison to make, make that timing more accurate. But um, you don't need a natal chart to do this kind of work, which is really amazing. People always send me their natal information when doing horror. I'm like, I don't, I'm not necessary. People don't know that though. But anyway, um, so this was, you know, I said about five weeks or five months, November, December, January, February, March, we're going late March. We're between four and five right now. So this is the time at which she just sent me an email and said, yeah, actually we're between four and five months right now. And it looks like my company is about to close. But the cool thing was that she had taken precautions after I gave her this reading, she had taken precautions and worked a bunch of overtime and took on a different shift and saved up some money preparing for the potential of losing her job. And now she has a little bit of um, a cushion to help her. I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. Sometimes I get things wrong. You know what I mean? And thank God someone didn't work a bunch of overtime and then nothing ever, you know, like, so sometimes like, and sometimes you can get things wrong and it's not necessarily like, you know, so it's, it's not like, I'm definitely not infallible with this technique, right? But in this case, one of the nice things about getting a horary right is that you can, um, you can, the oracle is like giving you a little bit of warning. It's like saying, hey, if it's going to rain, bring an umbrella. Horary can help you know, hey, something is coming. Yeah, the job isn't on totally stable footing and you can prepare. So this is a, an amazing way that Horary gives us a heads up. And it's another proof that the Oracle doesn't want us to just be prisoners of fate. You never, you ever notice how you get a sign or a hunch or a nudge saying, look, something is about to happen, but you could actually make it different if you shift your behavior or your choices or you do this, but not that. So similarly in Horary, there was a chart. In fact, uh, I'll tell you this story quick before I go to the second one. There was a chart that I did uh, when my wife was overdue with our first by 10 days, she was really worried about our daughter's health. And I cast a chart saying, is the baby in danger? And the signifier of the baby um, was heading right into a conjunction with the Lord of the house of death. So I was like, oh my God, you know, I got really freaked out. We went to the hospital just to have, we brought all of our stuff with just in case because she's 10 days late. And said, you know, we're just, just, they said we could come and check in at any time because my wife was having some anxiety about it. So we went in, they did the fetal heart monitoring, uh, whatever that's called. I think that's what that's called. And they detected that she, her heart rate was decelerating. And interestingly, the nurse who discovered that her heart rate was decelerating was named Virginia, which is the same name as our daughter. So that plus the horary um, you know, we, we took it as a sign that the horary had given us a heads up and they ended up because that her heart rate was decelerating. They immediately induced my wife into labor. She had a natural birth and they, but they monitored, they had to monitor the heart rate the whole way through, um, because of that. And we're ready to go into a C-section if necessary. Uh, but, and then they ended up dis discovering that, that there was an, um, I forget what the name of it is, meconium, meconium, something like that. It's basically when there's, um, fecal matter that's in the, um, uh, in, in maybe in abundance or in excess, um, 
in utero. And I'm sorry if I'm getting the test. Someone who's a doula out there, please explain what I'm, <laughs> help me articulate what I'm trying to articulate. But anyways, the doctors afterward were, were like, this really could have been disturbing her and maybe that's what was decelerating it. Or maybe she was just giving you the heads up that she wanted to come out. But at any rate, um, I forever took that as an example of the horary being like, you know, you you consult the Oracle, not just because you want to know what's going to happen, because also you want to know, you know, what to prepare for and being prepared doesn't hurt. You know, we do have free will after all. So the second horror that I want to show you that's related back to the coronavirus, I think is equally interesting. And this one's just another phenomenal um, example of planetary symbolism. So in this chart, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. In this chart, you are going to see this person asks the question, uh, will I be able to take my trip abroad? And this was earlier March. Now, I did a video on astrology of the coronavirus right around this time as well. And at this time, there was still not nearly as many cases as there are now. And I had someone ask, uh, basically, you know, will the will this epidemic um, get worse for the United States? Like how worse, a lot worse. And of course, if you go back and watch that video, the horror was spot on in terms of just how widespread and um, uh, much more intense the numbers would grow to be. Anyway, not I know a lot of people were predicting that. It's not a radical prediction, but it's amazing the way that the horary demonstrated exactly what would happen. Go back and check that one out if you want. It's pretty cool. But this person asked right around the same time where people were still traveling or planning to travel or thinking like, what are we talking about a couple of weeks here? Or, you know, it was still like two weeks ago, we were in a totally different world. You know what I mean? So this guy says, can I, should I go abroad? Can I go abroad? And here's the picture, right? He is we're going to give him again the ascendant ruler that becomes him in the horary gemini rising that makes him mercury uh and <clears throat> you will notice then we give him the co-significator of the moon now the travel itself abroad would be the ninth house ruler saturn i think it's pretty interesting in this case that the person said you know should i go abroad and also will i be able to go are they going to restrict travel or something like that and and this is uh, to Europe. And so in this case, the dead giveaway that you, there's a lot of other interesting things about this horror. I'll just keep it really simple. The dead giveaway is that his significator is parked, stationed, not moving in the sign of Saturn, right? And Saturn is of course, represents the trip. So what does that look like to you? I said, I think there's going to be a travel restriction to Europe. This was on March 9th at 1046 AM. I don't know when it happened, but I think it was that night or like the day after or Wednesday of that week. It was right around that time that Trump issued the uh, travel ban from Europe, I think, to the United States. And then it wasn't long after that, that a lot of the restrictions amped up. And of course, now, uh, it's probably a foregone conclusion that he's going to miss his travel in April to Europe. How do we get there? We get there through this, the Mercury that is stationed, meaning that's him and he's not moving. And he's in Saturn's sign, which obviously on a, on a natural level could represent sort of restrictiveness, but also by virtue of Saturn representing the trip here is also saying, look, you're not moving. You want to go. You're ruled by the trip. You want to go but you're, you're going to be in isolation. You know? so how's that, how fitting is that Mercury stationing in Aquarius for social isolation? Anyway, so the moon also here is in Mercury sign. And um, <clears throat> so um, the moon is, one thing I'll just add is that the moon is moving into an opposition with the sun and opposition between the lights in a horary is rarely indicative of success of the thing that's being asked about. Uh, the opposition between the lights means disharmony and conflict to a certain extent. So this was me saying, no, I don't think you're going to travel. Um, but this was, again, this was at the early stages before I certainly knew, or I think a lot of people knew, like how amped up and intense things were going to get. So anyway, these are just a couple of examples of horary. I have to say horary is easily my favorite form of astrology because every every time that you 
have to solve a horary question. It's like a, a riddle of the Sphinx. You're sitting in front of a chart that there is an answer in, but you have to use certain rules and techniques to try to discern what it is. And when you start being able to see the different ways in which the sky gives you the picture of what will happen, and then you're able to do it, it's just really beautiful. It makes you feel like you're, you're communing with something. Um, natal charts are great, but oftentimes with natal charts, it's just a little bit more impersonal. The word horary means of the hour. And so it, the horary as a practice really brings astrology into the nitty gritty and into really personal up to the minute kinds of situations. So I find it really interesting for that reason. Anyway, I offer horary readings on my website. If you ever want to do want to check it out, you can read all about what you have to, you know, kind of what questions are acceptable and things like that. Um, there I'm early still in my horary career. I consider horary one of the more difficult forms of astrology. So I offer a really cheap rate just, um, because I'm still, I'm still learning. Uh, I teach a one year horary class. That's very basic for people who just want to get to know it. If you want to check that out, like I said, you can go to my website, nightlightastrology.com, check out the courses page. Uh, the horary course is there. Uh, there's need-based tuition for people who, again, are, are suffering. We're not going to turn anyone down uh, for any of my classes uh, this spring. Uh, anything that, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we provide usually a sliding scale. So we first will ask people to work within that sliding scale. And if, if they still can't and they still want to study, which is, a good, again, a good thing to do if we're stuck for a long time, um, you know, we're going to work with whatever people can do. So uh, we're committed, definitely committed to doing that. Something that my wife and I did through our yoga studio for 10 years. We never turned away people for our yoga classes, always had donation-based options, stuff like that. So um, anyway, uh, so I thought you guys would find all this interesting. I hope you're having a good weekend. Um, I will be back uh, tomorrow with a video on Saturn entering Aquarius. Uh, so I look forward to that. There's a lot to unpack with that planetary aspect, which will be uh, ingress, I mean, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. So I hope you're having a good one. Take it easy. Bye.